Welcome to tonight's Live Fully, Live Well webinar, Eating Well, Eating Easy with Denise Nowak, Registered Dietitian and Programs Consultant for CanDo MS. My name is Scott Klein, Programs Manager at CanDo MS. Live Fully, Live Well is a wellness program for people with MS and their support partners. Managing your health and wellness is an integral part of living well with MS. Live Fully, Live Well is a comprehensive program from Can Do MS and the National MS Society designed for people with MS and their support partners. Live Fully, Live Well covers topics affecting the whole family with MS <clears throat> in order to strengthen relationships, increase understanding, and promote an improved health and quality of life for the person living with MS and their support partner. This program helps people living with MS and their support partner move from education to action. There are three aspects to this program. Six one-day in-person programs around the country, seven web-based videos introducing wellness topics, and 14 webinars covering the seven topics from the web-based videos, which is what you're participating in tonight. All three areas of this program can be integrated together or enjoyed separately to provide you with the resources, knowledge, and tools to create personalized wellness plan. <clears throat> this program is made possible by MS Active Source, which is sponsored by Biogen Eidic and Elan Pharmaceuticals. As I mentioned before, Live Fully, Live Well is a collaborative program be between Can Do MS and the National MS Society. The vision of the National MS Society is a world free of MS. The Society helps people affected by MS by funding cutting-edge research, driving change through advocacy, facilitating professional education, and providing programs and services that help people with MS and their families move their lives forward. Can Do MS is an innovative provider of lifestyle empowerment programs for people with MS and their support partners. We are the start of a whole new way of thinking about and living with MS. Can Do MS empowers people to move beyond their MS by giving them the knowledge, skills, tools, and confidence to adopt healthy lifestyle behaviors, actively co-manage their disease, and live their best lives. So a few housekeeping items before we get started tonight. Denise will address all the questions at the end of the presentation. However, we encourage your questions and comments throughout the presentation. To ask a question, type your uh, question in the chat feature located on the left side of your computer screen. To submit a question, just type in your question in the small box that says chat. Also, many of you submitted questions when you registered, and Denise will try to address those in her presentation tonight. This presentation is being recorded and will be archived on CanDo MS's website. You can view this presentation again or check out the other Live Fully Live Well archived webinars. For those of you who are attending live tonight, you will receive an email tomorrow with copies of this PowerPoint presentation. So we have a great speaker lined up with us tonight. <clears throat> Her name is Denise Nowak. She's a registered dietitian, and she has over 30 years of experience in community program development and delivery. For over 15 years, she served as the Executive Vice President of Chapter Program Services and Advocacy with the Southern California and Nevada Chapter, where she has played an instrumental role in establishing a wide array of programs addressing the the unique needs of those affected by progressive MS, including the Eric Small Centers for Optimal Living with MS and Society's uh, new fall prevention program, Free from Falls. During her tenure with National MS Society, she's co-authored Food for Thought, and she's contributing columnist uh, for a healthy living section of the Society's award-winning magazine, Momentum. Uh, she's worked to, to develop nutrition, education, and adaptive exercise programs for the MS community. In addition to being an avid cyclist who rides for, or in the uh, Chapters Coastal Challenge, Denise also volunteers training dogs to be service dogs uh, to people with special needs. So before we get started, we'll go ahead and uh, throw up a poll on the screen here. Um, so please tell us about yourself. Are you a person living with MS? Are you a support partner? Are you a healthcare professional or other? And so we'll give it a, just a moment or two here to uh, let people put their answers in. And it looks like, well, the the numbers are a bit skewed here. There's 100% of, 100 of us are living, uh, people living with MS, and there's 5% support partners. So we have 105% people out there, which is great, very strong number. Uh, but with that said, we'll go ahead and hand it on over to Denise. 
Thanks, Scott. I appreciate it, and I, I enjoy being here this evening. I, I love talking about this topic because um, so often um, life with MS can get in the way of eating well, and it doesn't have to be that way. And so tonight I really want to get at what gets in the way of eating well and begin to look at strategies that can help all of you integrate healthy eating into your everyday living. Um, there definitely is an interrelationship between aspects of your diet and, and how, you, um, how it impacts overall health, how it can impact MS, and how can it, it can help manage symptoms. And we'll go through all of that this evening. Um, but getting to the heart of it all, what keeps you from eating well? And that's a, a question I'd like for you to answer here. You don't have to check one thing. Check all the different things that apply. And we have those coming in. It, it gets down to the fact that eating well sometimes is a multiple of things. Uh, 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 one thing contributes to the other. And what we see here tonight is the most common one, certainly, that I hear most often from folks is that I'm just too tired. I'm too tired to manage through the meals. I'm too tired to cook. Um, but I see here also that um, folks don't feel like they have the right things on hand. And tonight I really hope that I can give you some ideas so that you're not caught in that situation um, and that that, that, that that is a part of your everyday life and that it's actually quite easy to do. And the, um, um, a bunch of you also feel like you just don't know what's healthy. And so as I talk about um, foods and I, as I talk about ideas, um, I'll tell you why it's important um, for um, living well with MS. So let's talk about the whole aspect of I'm just too tired to cook. Um, fatigue is such a common symptom for people with MS, and it really gets in the way of life. But when it gets in the way of eating well, it, there's sort of a vicious circle. Um, fatigue can cause people not to eat well, yet a poor diet, a diet that doesn't give you the nutrition that you need, that you don't get the vitamins and minerals that are important for metabolism, that you don't get the calories to fuel your body, can be a contributor to fatigue. So there are these secondary contributors to fatigue um, that go beyond just the MS fatigue. Um, it can be perhaps the fact that you're not sleeping well in the evening or that you're not exercising and there's depression. But diet can definitely be one of those. And we don't want that to be the barrier. So there are some real tactics that you can take to fight fatigue because first and foremost, food's your fuel. You need it to keep your body going. You need 800 calories a day just to think straight. Um, and, and so how can you make good nutrition uh, a part of your everyday living? So we'll start with snacking because um, I think there's this perception that snacking may not be a healthy thing to do, and it depends upon what you're snacking on. Um, but if you're a smart snacker, if you're a savvy snacker, and actually can keep your energy more even throughout the day. You know, if you think about it, you know, if we eat three meals a day, we have those really high highs in blood sugar, and we have those really low lows. But what snacking kind of does, if you eat more frequently smaller meals throughout the day, it can keep those energy levels consistent and keep the fuel that you need in your body um, accessible. Um, snacking also helps fight off hunger. And, and um, honestly, weight management can be a challenge, um, especially if mobility levels have changed and, and, um, and eating more is, is, a, is more of a habit that's, that, that, that comes up. Um, and so snacking can be something that can fight off hunger. It, it allows you to eat less at mealtime as well. Um, snacking can give you the opportunity also to give you the nutrients that you need that you might not be getting at your meals. Sometimes it's easier to um, take things in as a snack than it is to build into a main meal. So um, these are all important things to consider. So part of being a savvy snacker is to keep snacks on hand, and, and that could be in your cupboards. 
um, that can be where you are during the day. You know, do you do you keep a, a snack pack of um, nuts and dried fruit in in your your bag, or um, do you keep snacks in your car? Uh, I, I live in Los Angeles, and so um, commuting is very much a way of life here, and you can get stuck on the roads for quite some time. You don't need to be without those things if you have snacks available and on hand. And there are many things that are, um, you know, uh, packaged in a way that they have that sustainability, whether you keep it in your file cabinet at work or keep it in your purse or keep it in your, your car. So it's important to keep snacks on, on hand. Um, pick snacks that combine a combination of protein, a little combination of carbohydrates, and perhaps even a little combination of fats. Um, if we look at the snack suggestion that's here on the screen, you can see there's hummus, which is a great source of protein. And then we have um, uh, some, some brightly colored vegetables, you know, carrots and radishes. You know, these types of foods, especially the brightly colored foods, are a great source of antioxidants. And what we know about antioxidants is they can play a really um, key role um, in, in our well-being. And antioxidants may actually be beneficial in MS. Um, antioxidants act, act as scavengers of free radicals. And free radicals are these molecules in the body that are kind of rogue molecules. They um, can do damage at a cellular level. level. Um, they're missing an electron. Um, they, they, they are unstable. And what antioxidants do is stabilize these free radicals and diminish the damage that they can cause. In MS, these free radicals can have a direct impact on the nervous system. Um, it may kill cells that make that nerve insulating myelin. Um, they may block nerve conduction, um, which could indicate a possible role in how your symptoms manifest. And they may actually disrupt the blood-brain barrier, weakening that protective lining um, and escalating that immune attack. So antioxidants are important. And we find them in foods that are good sources of vitamin C, vitamin E, and beta carotene, which is we don't eat vitamin A, but we, we eat beta carotene. And beta carotene is found in those brightly colored fruits and vegetables, um, yellow, orange, red. Um, those fruits and vegetables are a good source of beta carotene. And so um, the thing about antioxidants, and one of the reasons we don't necessarily recommend the supplementation of antioxidant um, vitamins is because they also stimulate the immune system. And what do we know about MS? You know, MS is a, a condition where there is already a stimulated immune system. And we don't quite know yet if antioxidants boost the same level of the immune system as, as, um, uh, as that that's impacted by the disease. So basically, the best sources are, are from foods. And so, you know, including more brightly colored fruits and vegetables in your diet, it's not that hard to do. And, and I talked before about the role that it's easier to build them in sometimes with snacks than it is at a main meal. You know, at a main meal, you might have two side dishes and one of them may be a grain. Um, snacks can let you build it in a, a lot of different ways throughout the day. Um, here are some great snack ideas. And a stack doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to be a candy bar or a bag of chips. But you can see with each of these, there's a little bit of protein. And we, you, know, you see the protein here in the cheese, in the turkey, in the peanut butter, in the cottage cheese, in the nut butter here. Great sources of protein and a little bit of carbohydrate. So um, some some great snack options, and the key is to experiment with the things that you like. Another part about being a sna savvy snacker is, is picking the right, right snacks. And I'm using this label exercise as a way to better understand how the food label can help you make good food choices. Um, and, and I'm using this, um, I, I love this topic because it's butter versus margarine, which is, is, is better. And I'm just going to put the, the, um, the condition statement out here. The information on these labels is fictitious, but the exercise is still very real. So if we take a look at how do you read the food label, there's a couple of 
different things that are um, at play here. First of all, you have the calories, and it tells you what percentage of the calories come from fat or how much of the calories come from fat. With butter and margarine, it's no surprise. These are fats, so all the calories come from fat. But we, what becomes important then is what type of fat is in these products. So here we have a product that has 11 grams of fat. Okay, so um, these two types of fats, the saturated fats and trans fats, are unhealthy fats. Um, saturated fats are liquid, at, uh, solid at room temperature. Trans fats are, are man-made fats that have the same, not worse, not better, but the same health detriments as saturated fats do. And so about six years ago, the food label came out and allowed us to better make our decisions around healthy and unhealthy foods based on these two fats. So we have saturated fats, and this one has 7 grams of saturated fats, and this one has 2 grams of saturated fats. And as I mentioned, trans fats are as equally as bad as, as um, saturated fats. So in order to make our decisions on a product based on fat, we look at the total amount of, of fat that is unhealthy, and that's by adding these two together. So here's the question of the night. Which is better based on these food labels, butter or margarine? Let you weigh in on that one. So let's take a look at this. Most of you believe that margarine is, is, is better, and those of you, there are those of you that believe butter is better. And one of the things I want to um, uh, uh, help you understand with the, with the butter versus margarine thing is that um, really it is about the type of fat that is found in these products. And I think people believe that, that these trans fats that we talk about here are worse than saturated fats. But when you're making food choices, what really counts is the bottom line. And so if you're comparing crackers, if you're looking at cookies, if you're looking at other baked goods, if you're looking at frozen entrees, the bottom line, let's just say from a fat perspective, is what you want to look at. Um, so uh, hopefully that helps you make better food choices um, around your foods moving forward. The other key here is to um, take a look at how you are set up for success. You know, many of you shared that you don't have the foods on hand to eat well, and so I'm a big fan of having a power pantry. And a power pantry is um, having the right things st stocked in your cupboard, in your freezer, in your refrigerator that are on call that can be available to you to put together healthy meals. doesn't mean that you have to go shopping every day to get the foods that you need. And, and honestly, um, we don't have the time or the energy to do that on a, on a daily basis. So if we look at what we can keep in our cupboards, you know, canned beans and canned tuna or other canned meats like chicken or salmon, um, these are great sources of protein that, that are great to have on hand. Um, there are certainly fast cooking grains and pastas. Um, and I, I love now that there are these, these um, whole grain um, grains that are in these um, packaged packaged plastics that you pop in the microwave and heat in just 90 seconds, and you have really a great whole grain option available to you. Um, you have to watch the sodium content on some of these foods sometimes, um, but they are an option. You don't have to take um, 60 minutes to, to cook a healthy grain. Um, seeds and nuts and nut butters. Seeds and nuts are great to be able to throw into salads. Um, uh, you can throw them into cereals. Um, you can put them on top of yogurt. Um, a great way to get some, some 
uh, protein. And nuts and seeds are a great source of vitamin E as well, those antioxidant vitamins. Um, salad dressing, sauces, marinades, these are a staple in my cupboard. To be able to take a chicken breast out of the freezer, defrost it, and pop it in the oven with a marinade on it is a, a mainstay to getting you know, a meal done in, in 15 to 20 minutes. And that's what we're talking about here is how can we make it easy to eat well. Um, tomato products like sauces, canned tomatoes, um, uh, pasta sauces, um, whole grain cereals and breads. Um, these are all great ideas for staples in your cupboard. In the freezer, um, you know, fresh fresh fish, shrimp, you know, fish right now, you know, you, you, it's caught, it's flash frozen, it's very nutritious. The key is to be able to keep any of your frozen meats um, well sealed so they aren't subject to, to freezer burn. Um, cooked meatballs, whether it be vegetable, vegetarian, or chicken, um, stuffed pastas, watch those heavy cheesy ones because those can add up in calories and fat. Frozen vegetables, when you can't get to the store to get the fresh vegetables, this is a, an option that is great to have on hand. And you know what, there's a lot of healthy frozen entrees out there and dinners. Um, you just have to watch the, read the labels and see what those options are. And you know what? You can make your own healthy frozen dinners, too. I had a gentleman who would um, prepare a plate and put it in one of those um, food sealers and pop it in his freezer, and then he'd take it out for dinner and pop it in the microwave. So um, I always get some of my best suggestions for folks. Um, vegetables in the refrigerator. Um, ready to use is the pre-cleaned, pre-cut, shredded, those kinds of things. Um, those while they may cost a little more, if they cut 10 to 15 minutes out of your prep time and allow you to eat more healthful, they're a great option. Um, shredded cheeses, I'm grateful for the person who invented these because they really cut down on time. You know, and all these other things, um, yogurt, um, non-fat or low-fat dairy products. Um, you can buy garlic minced, ginger's minced. Um, they come sometimes in cubes frozen. You can keep them in your freezer. It makes seasoning foods very, very easy. So there's a lot of great options. Look at ways you can stock your cupboards to be successful and have these things on call. Because look at the different things you can do with your power pantry. And um, these, are, these are meals that I actually make at home. And um, when my day goes long and I don't feel like cooking, these are options that I put on call. Um, you know, to have a canned lentil soup with, uh, you know, one of those roasted chickens that you can buy at the grocery store um, and some pre-watched spinach, you know, it makes a great next day entree or lunch um, from the chicken that you had the night before. Um, you know, I talked about marinated chicken breasts or fish to be able to have them, you know, take them out in the morning, keep them in your refrigerator, um, and, and put a marinade on top. There's probably about four jars of open marinades in my refrigerator that I just use here and there on each of these. So um, here are some ideas that hopefully can be helpful to you. Other ways that you can make meals quick and easy is to start by having a plan. Um, whether that plan starts at the beginning of the week when you're doing your grocery shopping, you know, one of the strategies, maybe think through your week. What do you have going on? How might, you know, what might you do with your meals? You know, are you escorting the kids to a, a sports game that, you, that takes you out? Or, are, you know, are you out one evening for something else? You know, is your day busy? Um, have a plan plan and, and write it down because when you're tired, um, it, it's, those are the things that can escape your mind. So um, it's great to have those plans and, and having a plan in advance can also help you make sure you have the foods you need on hand when you want to cook. Uh, another thing around meal preparation is to really focus your efforts. You know, if you only have the energy to do one thing, then um, Focus on that entree, perhaps, and keep the sides simple. You know, we talked about quick cooking grains and, a, and, and steaming or microwaving a vegetable and adding a whole grain roll, and there you have a, a great, quick, and easy dinner. Um, you know, look at buying ready to use, but I understand that that can be costly. You know, and there are things that can help you. Um, chop and and slice and and um, make that aspect of meal.
preparation easy. Uh, I get concerned sometimes when people have um, like perhaps numbness in their fingers. Um, using knives can be um, a concern, and and those things can scoot around the table. Um, here are some ideas that you know a rocking knife is great. It's, it makes it very easy to chop things. Um, a mandolin or a food chopper. There's a lot of great options out there. Definitely give them a try because um, they can, uh, you know, they, they really can can make the cut quite easily. Other ideas to make meals quick and easy is to make sure your kitchen's set up for success as well. Um, and an occupational therapist is great because they can help look at your home from an energy efficiency standpoint. And I'm not talking about the electricity that we spend, but rather our own personal energy around this. Um, they can look at your kitchen and say, okay, you know, here's your dishwasher. Do you store your plates above your dishwasher, or do you have to walk all the way across the room to put them away? Are your pots and pans below the stove where you would use them? are the things that you use most frequently out on the counter. And so um, how you arrange your kitchen can help you be very energy efficiently, efficient personally. Um, collect your stuff first. Uh, gather up all the ingredients and all the tools you need. You can use a little rolling cart in your kitchen, or you can use a tray to carry it to the counter. Pull up a stool. Sit down. No one says you need to cook standing up. Or take it to a table and sit down and, and prepare your meal there. Um, again, how can you save energy all along the way? Cook once, eat twice. You know, get the most out of your meals. Um, I live with my husband, and so if we have a, a chicken, we're not going to consume it all in one meal. Yet, it's great for leftovers for, for dinner the next day or lunch. And here are some great ideas. You can do a chicken tostada with a, um, a healthy black bean and, and, and some leftover chicken and some vegetables on top, or a, whole, a pasta salad with... Um, whole grain pasta salad with spinach and tomatoes. A lot of great options. Salmon, I'm a big fan of salmon, and at those um, big warehouse stores, I will often buy a piece of salmon. Um, I love it. I'll either do two things with it. I'll either cut it up and seal it in um, meal-sized portions, which is a great way to, to take advantage of the economy of size and price here, or I roast the whole thing and uh, make perhaps a salmon pesto salad the next day or a pasta or a, a salmon fennel salad. There's a lot of ways you can reinvent meals. Be creative. Don't be afraid to, to try new things out. Um, the Internet can be an amazing resource for you for recipes, whether it be with new ingredients or reinventing meals. Um, go to the Internet. Um, just type in the ingredient you're using and just look for recipes, and a lot of different options come up. I look for recipes that have five ingredients or less. And I also look for recipes that, um, that have the taste that appeal to me. And I think that's such a big part of, of cooking is that I can make recommendations to you, but if it's not the way you like to eat, then really what good is it? So it's about finding the things that you like to eat and, and um, making that blend of taste and health come together. So let's talk about tips to healthful eating with MS. And we talked a little bit about um, fats in the diet and how those saturated and trans fats um, are, are less healthful. They have these negative health effects. We know they play a very key role in cardiovascular health. Um, they are usually solid at room temperature, and they're typically associated with animal products. So if we see that extra trim of fat, or the marbling in meats, or the skin on the chicken, those are all sources of saturated fat. The whole milk dairy products are those cheeses that just melt like a dream. If it's super flaky, super buttery, just melts in your mouth, you can bet there's a lot of saturated fat in it. Um, that's really an attribute of fat. But our goal is to try to limit our fats, especially these unhealthy saturated fats, and instead choose more healthful, unsaturated fats. And 
the, these unsaturated fats may actually have some positive health effects, not just for your overall health and well-being. We know that the monounsaturated fats play a very important role in cardiovascular health. Um, these are found in olive oils, canola oil, avocados, peanut butter. These are great sources of monounsaturated fats. But we know these polyunsaturated fats like safflower oil, corn oil, sunflower oil may actually have benefits with MS. Um, these fats play a very important role in myelination. You know, your body is still making myelin, um, and these naturally play a role in that. We know these unsaturated fats are also mildly anti-inflammatory, and they have other health effects as well. Um, Omega-3s are also unsaturated fats, and these are the fats that are found in these deep, cold ocean fish, like salmon and mackerel and tuna and sardines. And these fats, these un polyunsaturated fats and omega-3s, may actually be beneficial in reducing um, flare-ups and progress of the disease. Um, there have been some studies done in this. They're rather old studies, but this is a very healthful thing as a practice overall in your diet and has, um, may have uh, benefits that uh, apply to your MS. Omega-3s, um, in addition to being found in seafood, are also found in things like walnuts and flax seeds um, in order for you to access the um, the omega-3s and flax seeds, you actually need to be able to crush them um, or have them ground. So, um, but these are all great sources of um, healthy fats. So if you're looking to fit fat in your diet, again, fats can be healthy. Keep your protein choices lean. Um, you can have meats. Uh, uh, lean meats like the loin cuts, the flank steak, the sirloin, um, the, um, the round cuts um, of, of red meats are fine. Um, chicken, the light meat of the chicken is, is lower in fat than the dark meat, but, both, but if you take the skin off, both are very healthful. Um, choose lower fat dairy products. Um, dairy products are a great source of protein and calcium, which are very important, which is very important for bone health. But we don't need that fat, so look for either 1% or non-fat dairy products. Um, include more seafood in your diet. You know, to get the benefits of omega-3, you only need to have seafood in your diet a couple days a week, and we're only talking about three or four ounces of seafood. And the health benefits from from seafood far outweigh the potential risk from um, you know, mercury poisoning or issues. I know there's been a lot of concern about that, but the medical community certainly weighs in that the health benefits far outweigh any risks, unless, of course, it's much more prudent if you're pregnant to avoid um, um, that type of seafood. But you can also take omega-3s in a supplement form. Um, so 2,000 international units of omega-3s is, is safe. Um, other ways to trim the fat in your diet is to look at some non-animal sources of protein, like beans and peas and lentils, and look at seeds and nuts as snack foods. Um, there's a lot of great ways to um, use alternatives to fat, um, broths and wines and, and marinades. Um, even though there, there are fats that are healthy, it's important to still use them sparingly. We talked a little bit about antioxidant-rich fruits and vegetables when we were talking about snacks and the benefits of these. But these, these, these same foods also are important from a fiber perspective, and, and fiber is a good, um, important thing in the diet. And with fiber must come fluids. Um, fiber helps in managing constipation, and, and constipation can be directly related to MS, but it can also be secondary to perhaps less activity, um, not a good source of fiber in the diet. Um, perhaps you're limiting your fluids, and, and fluids play an, an important role in, um, uh, in the metabolism of fiber. Um, fiber also creates a sense of fullness, so it can play a really key role in weight management. So if you're going to be snacking on foods, it, it makes sense to, to make these some of your choices. We need about 20 to 35 grams of fiber a day. So if we start breaking it down by meals and thinking about perhaps 10 grams at breakfast, 10 grams at lunch, 10 grams at dinner, it makes it a little bit more manageable. 
Um, you know, if we look at just breakfast, there are certainly um, whole grain cereals out there and fiber-rich cereals, many more choices now on the food shelves. And it's not uncommon to find 10 grams of fiber in a cereal. Um, but you can make your own high fiber cereal. Um, cereals could be expensive, uh, but if you if you take a bran flake and if you look at the cereal boxes, when you take a bran flake and then add a raisin to it, the fiber content goes up. And then when you take a bran flake and add dried fruit and perhaps a nut, the fiber content goes up even more. So so um, you can you can pick your own fruits. You know whether it be dried cherries or uh, cranberries or blueberries, they don't have to be raisins. Um, and the nuts can be almonds or um, walnuts, whatever your choice are. So look at ways to be creative with, with these types of things. Um, more beans, peas, and lentils. You know, we talked about them being a great source of low-fat protein, um, but they're also a great source of fiber. And if you're going to eat your vegetables and fruits, you'll get a little bit more fiber with the skin on. Um, you know, the ready-to-use vegetables may be also be a great way to make sure you have vegetables in your diet, um, and, and they are a, a good source of fiber. So um, if you have not been using fiber or including fiber in your diet, um, do start slowly, um, because if you start too fast or add too much in, it really can be a little discouraging. Um, and I talked about fluids being very important. Um, fluids um, help bring bulk to fiber, and that allows it to move through your system, your intestinal tract, much more easily and sort of act as a broom that pushes things through your system. If you think about it, think about oatmeal. When it starts out in its container, it's rather dry and small. But when we cook it with water or milk, it gets all nice and puffy, and fiber is the same way. And that's why fluids with fiber are important. Um, fluids are important also from an overall health perspective, and I find that with individuals who are living with MS, they may limit their fluid intake because of bladder issues or needing to visit the bathroom more frequently. But, it, it, you know, limiting fluids has its consequences and that it can cause um, dry mouth, it can cause problems with swallowing, um, it could decrease your appetite, we know the consequences of that. And so, um, Really, don't forget fluids. Um, and it's really kind of easy to fit it in. Um, my guess is many of you are taking medications at least once, maybe twice a day. And it's a perfect time to make sure that if you're going to do it, take it with a full glass of fluids, whether it be water or juice or whatever you use to, to do that. Um, take a beverage with every meal and your snacks. It makes it easy to fit it in. Um, juices, you have to watch sometimes they can add up calorie-wise, and so if you dilute them or make a, think about making a fruit spritzer with sparkling water or club soda, um, it can help um, cut some of those calories. And nowadays, you know, having our own personal water supply, whether it be a, a, a bottle of water with us or, or whatever, um, it's, 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 it's an easy way to make sure you have that on hand. Um, but we do get fluids from our food, and I think um, we can't forget about that. And it's no surprise. If it's juicy, it's a good source of fluids. And about 20% of our daily fluid intake comes from foods like tomatoes, watermelon, squash, um, lettuces. So um, these are all contributors of fluids in our diet. So let's look at what else we can do to make sure we're eating well and healthful with MS. And it's, it's important to manage your diet and exercise to control weight. Um, you know, carrying that extra five pounds around can really be a contributor to fatigue as well. I mean, think about it. If I ask each of you to pick up a five-pound bag of flour right now and walk around the block, or just through the house, um, you'd feel that. All of us probably would. And, and that extra five pounds on us can play that same role. So if MS symptoms have changed your activity levels or have reduced mobility and you're eating the same, chances are the result may be weight gain. And so you have to look at ways that you can cut calories. And those calories, you know, fat's a very expensive source of calories, um, and that's a good place to start. And, and looking at foods that really don't provide a lot of nutritional value, you know, foods that may be high in sugar um, and um, really don't have much to them. Um, 
The other thing that's important is to keep your bones strong. Um, individuals with MS may be at risk for osteoporosis or osteopenia, which is somewhat of the prelude to osteoporosis. Um, and that's the thinning of the bones. And um, that can be caused due to less activity. It can also be caused due to um, some of the medications you may be on. And steroids, um, which is commonly used um, to knock down that inflammation uh, uh, around an exacerbation, can be a contributor to osteoporosis. So maintaining good bone health is really important. And hanging on to every bit of bone mass that you have is, is critical. And calcium is that nutrient that builds and maintains your bones. We need about 1,200 milligrams of calcium a day. And they're most readily available in dairy products. Um, we can find them in dark green leafy vegetables like spinach and kale. But these foods actually have a natural component called an oxalate that interferes with the absorption of calcium. So these foods are very good, and I wouldn't eliminate them from the diet, but I wouldn't rely on them as your sources of calcium. So, um, so the other thing around calcium is that you can supplement. You can take a calcium carbonate or a calcium citrate supplement. These are, these are very absorbable sources of calcium that are very well tolerated. Um, the secret is you can't take all 1,200 milligrams at one time. It's really recommended to split it between the day. The body absorbs it much better. Um, the other thing is vitamin D is very important for calcium absorption. And, and vitamin D is the new hot nutrient. And we get vitamin D from our skin exposure to the sun. Now, you don't have to go out and lay in your bathing suit, but um, just hand and face exposure to the sun um, can help you get the, you know, the vitamin D that, that you may need. Um, but during these dark months now that we're in, and in our northern climates where it may not be so sunny during the day, it can be very difficult. And we're finding that the population as a whole is, is become rather deficient in vitamin D. And it's hard to say what the contributors to that are. But what we're seeing happening is that the recommended levels of vitamin D, um, the recommended levels of vitamin D, like were once 600 international units, we're now seeing levels of 2,000 to 4,000 international units being acceptable and generally recognized as safe. And that, that supplementation may be what we need to get the adequate level of vitamin D um, that's important in our overall health and well-being. Vitamin D, there's um, a lot of interest in vitamin D. Vitamin D may be linked to a variety of autoimmune conditions and other health conditions. Um, we do know that with MS that, that vitamin D may play a role in the prevention of MS. But research is pointing now to the fact that, that, that vitamin D may um, actually play a role in the course of MS. And I think this is a really encouraging area to keep our eyes on, keep our eyes on moving forward. Now, people can take higher levels of vitamin D. And I've, I've heard of individuals on over 10,000 international units. But it's really important to first take a look at what your blood levels of vitamin D are. Are you deficient in D? You know, are your blood levels low? And then under a doctor's supervision, look at bringing those levels back up. Each individual responds very differently to vitamin D intake. And, and so, um, and, and the key here is also to supplement, also to supplement um, only to the level that you need to bring those levels back up. And so, again, that 2,000 to 4,000 international units is safe. Anything over that, I would highly recommend that, that um, you be under the watchful eye of your doctor and, and that higher levels can be very helpful um, if you are deficient. I guess the takeaway of tonight is that nutrition really can play an important role in living well with MS. I, I think it's just really an underutilized tool um, in, in, the fight a lot of, uh, in the fight against a lot of different conditions. And, and really, if you understand how powerful food can be in its natural source, really, I think it's cornerstone to living well with MS. So I... Thank you all for coming here this evening, and I'd like to open up to the question, Scott. All right. Well, uh, <clears throat> we do have a, a few really, really great questions. So um, 
Let's see where to start. Uh, there are actually a couple of questions about coconut oil. The coconut oil, is it a good fat or a bad fat? Oh, my goodness. That's the first time I actually have had that. I usually address it in my presentation. Coconut oil is a bad fat. Actually, coconut, um, coconut oil is very saturated. It's one of the vegetable oils that are very saturated. Coconut oil, palm oil, palm kernel oil, those are all um, saturated fats. Um, again, the key to saturated fats is they're usually solid at room temperature. And so um, these are the types of fats you want to use more sparingly. Um, and, and I know that that has a wonderful flavor to it too, but um, you definitely use that much more sparingly. Great. And uh, to go along with that, there was also a question that came up. Um, do you have any insight on the use of hemp oil? Um, I don't see hemp oil often used in cooking, so in food preparation. And um, there is really no benefit to taking oil as a supplement. It, it has those extra calories associated with it. Like flaxseed oil, I don't know that I would recommend taking flaxseed oil. I would recommend eating flax seeds and getting the benefit of the omega-3 from that. Um, oh, but I'm sorry, it but, was hemp but, seeds. Oil. Yeah, and so hemp is the same way. You okay. don't cook. I, I don't see people cooking with hemp oil, and so I'm gotcha. saying you wouldn't add an oil like hemp as just a, take a teaspoon of it and and um, just just eat it. So uh, so I, I've not heard of any any um, health benefits from that from an MS perspective. Okay. Um, well, uh, here's another uh, really interesting question. Is uh, quinoa, is it a fiber, uh, protein, carb? What is quinoa? Quinoa is, um, I don't want to say it's a new grain on the market because it's not like it just has appeared. Quinoa is a grain product. It, it looks a little bit like um, a, a, a barley type of grain. It's very small. It's a little bit bigger than couscous, but it's a little bit smaller than barley. It's a great source of protein. It is a great source of fiber. And so it's one of those very protein-rich fibers that we don't really see a lot of. And they're a great, it's a great one to add into the diet. Um, it, it picks up the flavors of whatever you put with it. Um, you can make salads out of it. Um, it's kind of one of those new super, super, super fiber um, grains that are out there. Good choice. Okay. Excellent. And uh, a couple of questions about vitamin D. Um, can you, is, is it a fallacy that you can get uh, your vitamin D from a tanning booth? Oh, you know, um, I don't know about that. Um, I have to say, I have to uh, defer to another source on if you can get your vitamin D from a, a tanning booth. You know, I heard um, Dr. Colleen Hayes speak. Um, she's with the University of Wisconsin. She's been doing a lot of research around vitamin D and MS. And okay. um, she says a healthful tan is important, but you don't just want to tan for the sake of tanning. You know, I think from a, it, it, it probably is um, probably recommended and probably more safe is to get your vitamin D, and we're talking about D3 from a supplement form. Uh, I mean, it's certainly a, a, a lot easier um, and maybe even a little less expensive than that tanning booth. Okay, terrific. And... Uh, one person had a question about omega-3, um, and is it beneficial to people with MS? Yeah, omega-3s um, do play a very important role. Omega-3s have great health benefits. Um, I think what we're seeing with omega-3s is they can play an important role in cognition. We know they play an important role with cardiovascular health. And I talked about a little bit of research that was done um, with the unsaturated fats, and these omega-3s may actually play a role in um, slowing the progress of disease. And I think we're looking at more research in this area, but um, certainly um, omega-3s have far-reaching health benefits, in, including a potential benefit for people with MS. Okay, terrific. Um, let's see. Um, are antioxidants more beneficial coming from a food source or a supplement source? Oh, gosh, I love this question because Mother Nature is brilliant, um, and they are better from a food source, and here's why. 
In our foods, we find in addition to the naturally occurring antioxidants, we also find things that are called phytonutrients. And phytonutrients are things you probably heard about, lutein, lycopene. There's a number of them. Um, and when I first started studying nutrition, we didn't know anything about phytonutrients. And phytonutrients in these foods, these naturally occurring compounds, actually boost the power of the antioxidants. And so they're very synergistic. So um, not only do you have the benefits of the antioxidants, but now you get this, this boost from these other compounds that are, that are found in foods naturally. Um, single nutrient supplementation can be problematic because um, things can get out of balance and it can impact the absorption and effectiveness of, of, of of nutrients. And so you also start taking something like a, a, a nutrient in, in, a, in a level that functions more like a drug. And we have to recognize when we start megadosing supplements that, that that's how the body actually treats it. If you think you might be deficient in something, I'm an advocate for a good multivitamin mineral supplement as that insurance. Okay, terrific. Um, and there have been a couple of questions about uh, <clears throat> the consumption of alcohol and, and caffeine. Uh, can you kind of speak to that a little bit? Yeah, both of those are, are, um, are, are great um, questions because caffeine and alcohol um, act in the body as a diuretic, and so they can be, um, if you have issues with bladder issues, they can aggravate um, the bladder. Um, alcohol obviously has some health benefits in moderation. We know that, um, especially those, those um, deep red wines. They, ha they certainly have um, health benefits overall. But for individuals with MS, you have to know how alcohol impacts you, and, and moderation is key. Um, if you are um, susceptible to um, dizziness or balance issues, alcohol can um, really um, aggravate that and, and, and um, be somewhat problematic. Caffeine, um, caffeine is oftentimes looked at as that boost to give you a little bit more energy to overcome fatigue. It can be effective that way. It is very short-lived and short-term. Um, I would watch overconsumption of caffeine. Um, uh, okay. Yeah. Good to know, good to know. And um, one person asks, uh, what, are, what are the good fibers out there that aren't white fibers, for instance, um, rice, uh, bread, potatoes, pastas, all the, all the things that you see as, as white breads and, and that sort of thing? Can you kind of uh, give a little explanation there? Yeah, so we talk about healthy fats and uh, unhealthy fats. Um, there are also healthy carbohydrates and unhealthy carbohydrates. And the more processed the carbohydrate is, so white flour, um, white rice, the less whole grains, the, um, the whole, more whole grain products are more healthful. They are metabolized more slowly in the system. They, um, they uh, provide that extra fiber um, that you don't find in those more processed foods. Um, so your, your healthier carbohydrates are going to be more, more whole grain process, uh, pastas, um, whole grain breads, and the key is to look at the food label too. Um, you can, you know, don't let the color of the bread fool you either. You know, I and I've been duped myself in in grocery stores. I've gone into some health food like markets, and and I pick up a loaf of bread and I look at the label and I find that it has no more fiber than um, the white bread or sourdough bread sitting next to it. So take a look and see if you're looking for that for your fiber. The fiber content is listed right there on the food label. And you should be looking at products of three grams of fiber or greater. So um, let that be your guide. That's, and that's great words of advice, I guess, I guess, across the board, is to always look at the label and make sure you know what you're consuming, huh? It lets you be a savvy consumer. We, we, we had yeah. a couple tools that, that we, we shared tonight that can help yeah. you be more effective at that. Definitely. Okay, and uh, another really good question here. Um, what do you do uh, when all those fresh uh, vegetables and, and fruits are out of season and, and they're difficult to get or they're really expensive? Do you have any recommendations on, on how to uh, kind of supplement those, uh, those really good veggies out there? Yeah, you know, um, if there is a, a continuum of um, quality, 
Um, I would say that, that your next best bet would be frozen vegetables. Um, and the key is to make sure that when you buy your frozen vegetables, you, you use them within a reasonable period of time. I, I've had my share of frozen vegetables accumulate um, frostbite in my freezer, and, <laughs> and um, that, that um, really doesn't that, – that compromises the quality of it. But frozen vegetables sure. are great because they don't have that, the sodium necessarily associated with it as some of the canned vegetables. And if you go to canned, you know, canned can certainly be – nutritious too, um, but they can also be high in sodium. So just watch the sodium content of those. Um, things like um, uh, tomato products are actually enhanced in their nutritional value when they're heated. So you know, taking a canned tomato and cooking it in a, in a dish actually can enhance the, the, the vitamin C level in those types of foods. You know, of course, not overcooking them. So um, you still have healthy choices that aren't fresh. Um, take advantage of what is in season, though. It's a great time, again, to be, be creative. And, um, you know, I ventured out this year with new vegetables I haven't tried before. And, and again, I use, I use the Internet as my guide to try some new things with some new recipes. Um, and the, take advantage and look at what's on sale and, 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 and what's in season and, and, and buy that way and, and be adventurous around that. That's great. And do you have any recommendations? Uh, you had mentioned the Internet. Do you have any recommendations on, on where to go? Or uh, do you just generally plug in something uh, on, a, on a search engine, uh, maybe a couple of ingredients, and just look for recipes? Or how do you yeah. go about that? Yeah, I tend to put like um, uh, I had a unique squat. I'll give you an example. Last week I was cooking a, a dinner for friends, and I found a squash. I've never cooked a delicata squash. I didn't even know what it was. Mm -hmm. So I put the name of the squash in the search um, engine, and I put recipes after it. And then I saw what came up. And, and you start finding websites that really um, work well for you, and there's so many of them out there. Um, magazines like Real Simple or Eating Light are, have great healthy recipes. Real Simple usually has recipes that are um, really quick and easy to do or things that you could, if you buy these ingredients, you can make 10 meals out of them. Um, it's finding those things, again, that might appeal to your personal taste. And, you know, for each of us, that's very different. Um, if, you, if you have a recipe that doesn't appeal to you, you're not going to eat it. So find the things that have the ingredients that you like. Good advice. Um, and just a couple more questions here. Uh, one, one person asks, uh, is, is it true that uh, people living with MS should stay away from dairy? Um, no, you don't have to avoid dairy at all. I think there is a, a misperception around that. Really the issue with dairy is the saturated fat and that's oftentimes found in dairy. So, you know, again, because dairy can be a great source of calcium, which we very much need, especially as we get older, um, um, the, those are great sources of calcium. Just go, to the, go low. Um, go, go either low, 1%, or skim. And, you know, you might find you can tolerate different things with different products. You know, I, can, I enjoy nonfat yogurt. I enjoy nonfat cottage cheese. I can live with nonfat milk. I don't like it in my, my coffee. I drink one cup of coffee a day, and that's not what I like in it. But you get to make that choice. Um, but as low as you can go, um, it, it's great. And, and like I said, there are definitely some health benefits that unless you're lactose intolerant, which can happen to individuals as well as they get older, um, um, there's no need to really avoid that dairy. Okay, great. And one last question here, and we had this in the um, last webinar too. Can you uh, kind of get a, give advice about um, gluten-free uh, diets and um, you know what uh, what people living with MS should should know about uh, gluten-free diets? Yeah, I think there's a lot of information that's out on the Internet that, that makes people believe that those who are living with MS should be on a gluten-free diet, and that's not necessarily the case. What, what, um, what is in common with people with celiac disease and MS is that they both are disorders of the immune system. And for people with celiac disease, um, gluten is the issue. And gluten is a protein that's found in grains like wheat and barley and rye. And what gluten does for those individuals is that it triggers an immune attack and that immune attack is on the, the gastrointestinal tract. 
And so MS is also a situation that is an immune attack, but we don't know what it triggers, what triggers it. And so um, it doesn't mean that those two, because they're triggering autoimmune conditions, that they're the same and that you need to eliminate gluten. Now, it's interesting, though, people that might, um, people with MS, there is a greater gluten sensitivity, which is different than um, um, celiac disease. Um, there's greater gluten sensitivity and perhaps also celiac within individuals who are living with MS. But I would say unless you're experiencing chronic diarrhea, um, um, great GI distress, um, that um, you probably aren't gluten intolerant. If you question that, I would visit um, your doctor, uh, talk to a gastroenterologist, and be evaluated. All that can be tested. Um, you don't need to eliminate something from your diet that you don't have to. And, and um, grain products certainly have certain nutrients that are important. Um, and if it's not a problem, I wouldn't, I, there's no benefit to get rid of it. Okay, terrific. Denise, thank you so much. What a what a informative presentation you just provided. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and, and a big thanks to all the participants who joined us for this webinar. Uh, this is our last uh, Live Fully, Live, Live Well webinar um, in the series. Uh, however, we do encourage you to attend uh, our other webinar series. Uh, this entire Live Fully, Live Well webinar series can be viewed in its entirety on our website, www.mscando.org. As soon as this presentation is over, you'll see a survey appear on your computer screen. Please take a moment to complete the survey and help us to improve our webinars. Um, we value your feedback and your input, and we thank you very much for attending. This program was made possible by MS Active Source, sponsored by Biogen IDEC, and Elan Pharmaceuticals. Have a great night, everybody.